Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, brought to you by Advancing Analytics, your friendly neighborhood data and AI consultancy. And yeah, I want to talk about Databricks Genie. In fact, we've got a couple of videos lined up talking about Genie. If you've not come across Genie before, we've done a video when it was first announced. Uh, but this is kind of more of a getting hands on, getting to grips with it, getting an idea of how it works. So what is Genie? Genie is your AI LLM powered assistant that sits next to you acting as a data analyst for you. That's important to get that in your head as to what it's actually doing. It's a SQL writer. So you're sitting there with your AI buddy next to you saying, hmm, tell me, what, tell me about this data. And it'll tell you about the data. Uh, ask it a question. Who made the most? Who did the most? How many things did we do? And it'll return some results. And then you're kind of digging into it. Okay, between those two, what, what was the distance between those two? Why, what caused that happening to that? Uh, could we actually see it grouped another way? Visualize that. Kind of giving commands. Each command goes off, runs some SQL inside of Databricks, brings back some results, and then shows you the results. So just a, it's a chat. It's a chat with your data, a la Copilot, a la uh, ChatGPT, all of that kind of stuff. It's running on your data within your Databricks ecosystem. And importantly, it can't see the data. That's a weird concept to get your head around. If you say, well, what does that figure mean? I don't know. I, I can't actually see what that figure is. All I'm doing is running SQL and showing you the results that the SQL I've generated gave me without looking at the results myself. So it's good for data security. If people are thinking you can just ask it low level detailed questions about what an individual figure means, it's not going to have that context. What does that actually mean? How do people actually work with it? That's that's the question. So we've got one that we've set up. We've had a play with. We've kind of could put some stuff in there, giving it a personality so people can go and interact with that data set. And then we'll do a follow up video about how we made it and how we put it together and the various different steps you can go through to get it there. And then there's another video because there's a load of guidance about the best way to use Genie, how to start with it, how to think about building it out, how to choose what you put in it and how you separate it and how many Genie rooms you should have. So plans for the videos that are coming as always if you're new around here don't forget to like and subscribe and yeah let us know what you want us to be doing if you've got any weird and wacky ideas i'm happy to build some weird things so just let me know what you're looking at so let's go and have a look at what we're doing so a little bit of context context hey uh so advancing analytics were asked to take part in what's known as a bake-off it's a very gartner style thing where you say we've got bunch of different vendors we want them to all actually do a technical demo and it's a bit of a competition bit of a hackathon that kind of thing and given the term bake-off was used obviously we just went for the great british bake-off or the great british baking show i think if you're over in the us what a twee happy reality tv show competition from the uk which is all to do with making various different baked treats and pies and cakes and all that kind of stuff so we thought, okay, let's do it based on that. Let's go and grab some data, bring it in, build a room, give it some personality around that, a bit of theming, so the users actually interact and connect with it a bit more than it would if it was a really bland, plain, just a bit of data that didn't mean anything. That's what we're trying to demonstrate. So first things first, out on CRAN, I came across uh, just someone had done a scrape of a load of data from the British Bake Off. So we got that, we pulled it in. Uh, you can go and get the raw data files. So that's what it's based on. We'll go through the steps of how I actually got it working in another video. What we have is the Ask Hollywood genie room. Paul Hollywood being one of the presenters uh, of, of the Great British Bake Off. So, yeah, we've got this genie room here. I'm coming in here as, as a user, just going, okay, I've, I've, I've been presented with this space. I've got a bunch of questions that I can go and ask it. So I can say, well, what is the Great British Bake Off? It's going to go and think about it, and then it's going to tell me some information. There you go. Those are new US Great British Baking Show, Hit UK, UK TV Show, Amateur Bakers, Baking Challenges, etc. It's a delightful mix of creativity, skill, and drama. Ah, oh, there we go. Couldn't have said it better myself. So that's it. So who are we talking to? So we can give it again. It's it's trying to create a bit of a persona, a bit of personality. Uh, it's the it's the ghost of Paul Hollywood. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so we're, we're speaking to the ghost of Paul Hollywood. I didn't know he was he wasn't around anymore. But still, so we're speaking to a virtual Paul Hollywood assistant who's going to tell us things. So tell us about the data. So what data does the genie room have? Genie rooms, when you create it, you give it a scope. You say, well, these are the tables that are in the mix. 
for this particular room. So it's got a bunch of things. It's got Baker results, challenge results, episodes, and ratings. So that's good. It means I can say, well, tell me about the actual people competing. I can go say, what happened on this particular challenge? I can say, who won overall? I can say, do people watch more or less? Did it get more popular or less popular as it went on? They're the kind of questions I can ask. And you saw that when we came in, it had some preceded questions giving me a hint about the kind of things we could talk about. Okay, so that's me coming in with no context going, well, just tell me about yourself. And I've gotten some good information. So based on that, I can, I can see, okay, so data on the results of Bakers. I've got some preceded questions. Let's just go, well, how many uh, contestants were from Essex? It feels like a lot of them are from Essex. Show me a list that includes their age, job, and location. So basically, I'm writing the SQL query. I'm saying, well, do a select star from the Baker results. Tell me these particular columns only when they're coming from Essex. And it's going off, having a think. He goes, OK, here are my various different contestants that happen to come from Essex. Now, I think there's a bit of a skew there. Like Paul Hollywood, I'm from a place in the UK called the Wirral. Uh, so what about the Wirral? Is anyone actually from the Wirral taking part, not just Paul Hollywood presenting it? Does he have some intrinsic bias against people from his own hometown? He does. There we go. There's only one person who came from the Wirral. Ah, great. So I've got some nice, easy querying I can do. I can just ask some questions of the data. I can follow up with context. Again, that's the nice thing. I didn't have to say, show me their name, age, job, and location. It's got the previous chat window context history. So it knows that's the information I'm after, and it's given me the data I need. Okay, great. Well, let's, let's do some more results-based thing. Let's go and say, who won the most technical challenges? Technical challenges are the ones that is a, is a blind thing. They're not told what it should look like. They're just given some quite vague instructions. So it's quite a hard thing they're trying to do. So it's normally a good sign of actually who's who's pretty good, who's who's good at different, different things. Okay, so we can see what we've asked for is the top for each series. So who won the most technical challenges in each series, in a whole bunch of series, and Word of warning, this data is like three years out of the date. So if you looked at the most recent series, they're not in here. Um, but you can see James was the winner of the most number of technical challenges. So we can go and like dig in and just have a look going, okay, how does, how does that relate? Who was the overall winner? What happened there? What I'm actually interested in is a whole bunch of different people, especially with the kind of range of different ages that we've got. Let's ask a few more questions about the bakers. So... I want you to create buckets of ages and blocks of 10 for 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 11 to 20, etc. Just tell me roughly the distribution of ages across my different bakers. Who are they all all around the same? Are they fairly spread? Okay. Well, I've got some interesting different ranges that we've got here. So between 11 and 20, quite a few. I'm assuming they're towards the end of that age bracket. It's not junior bake off that we're looking at um a decent chunk in their 20s loads in their 30s starts to tail off goes down and down and they've got one person who is over 70 and that's not just mary mary um but yeah okay well that's that's interesting but one of the things we can do i personally know the way the show works is the more episodes you're in the better you're doing right because it's a knockout competition so if i appear and i there's 10 of us and i'm in the first episode you don't see me again well I didn't do very well. I got kicked out right at the start. So actually, if we try and then do a little bit of analysis and go, well, how long did they last? So if we look at the distribution of ages, we can see how many people are in there, and then the average number of episodes. So in this age bracket, how many people were there, but how long did they last? So actually, we can kind of see, well, the 70 to 80 age bracket, there was only one person. They didn't last that long. In the 20th, they tend to ask, uh, act a long time so actually the people between in their teens and 20s or the people in their 60s actually surprisingly last for a long amount of time whereas 30s 40s definitely 50s there's a thing to drop as to how long they last so the types of different contestants depending on what they do actually affects how long they do statistically in terms of what we're looking at statistically not that confident statistically but still we can go and have a look okay so i've kind of got a good idea of the the kind of people taking part and how well they performed. I want to go a different direction now. I mean, there's there's a couple of different types of challenge they do. But what I really want to know is which of the showstoppers did they actually make a pie? I don't know how many pies they actually made as the big grand finale of, of the different episodes. Okay, I've got 49 rolls. I've got all these different things. I've got who made it. 
And I've got the pie there because he made it. Okay, that's, that's interesting. That is interesting. But 49 rows, is that is that a lot? Is that is that barely any of them? So we can dig into it further. I can go, well, actually, show me the number of showstoppers that involved a pie versus those that didn't. Visualize it as a pie chart. I can actually, you know, on, on brand, on theme, I'm using things actually how they should be. So we've got the account of showstopper challenges. Gives you our account, categorizing them. It's talking like a scouser. It's weird. Uh, so I've got the ones that are not a pie, the ones that are a pie. Obviously, the majority of showstopper bakes aren't a pie because they tend to do cakes and biscuits and various things like that. But, oh, slight, slight confusion. That's not a pie chart. Pie chart. That's a donut chart. I'm pretty sure that's a donut chart, not a pie chart. So, you know, it's a bit, a bit embarrassing that Paul Hollywood uh, knows more about pies than I do. Let's get this right. What? Okay, well, I'm not going to argue with them. You know, it's 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 going to be the way it is. Um, but I want to understand more. So we've got some weird and wonderful showstoppers that we've got in here. There's lots of different things in there. Uh, what I'm curious about, how many times does someone who made a rhubarb-flavoured uh, showstopper in some way get eliminated from the show? So we've got some stats about elimination. We know what round they got eliminated on. We know what they did in that episode. So just to get an idea, going, oh, okay, so... Should I make rhubarb when I go on the show? Uh, let's have a look. Two, there were two rhubarb eliminations. Oh, what does that mean? That doesn't have me that much. Show me the details. Got these eliminations. So I want to know who made that. What did they make? What was the thing they made that had rhubarb that meant they got eliminated? Okay, there we go. So we've got two times this happened. We've got the two things they made, a rhubarb and custard meringue pie. That's a weird cut. Maybe that's why they went out. Uh, and we've got kind of, oh, a crumble, rhubarb and orange betty, lots going on there. So that's why they went out. Okay, oh, interesting. It can help me plan what I should be making. I can think about what I should be doing as, as my thing. Again, just lots of question asking. Kind of what this is really, really good for is that rapid fire. Ask a question, go, oh, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And just get the answers and dig further and further into things. Let's change track again. We've got ratings information in our data. So, how many views has the baker had by series in the seven day rolling average? Put of the bars on the number of views. So generally, has it gotten more popular over time as the series became more mainstream? How did that actually work? Okay, so yes, generally. So the first series wasn't that popular and then it just became more and more popular, it became this big, massive thing. And then there was a drop off. Now, that's, that's weird. Between Series 7 and Series 8, just this huge cliff of ratings where it goes down and doesn't really recover. That's obviously quite strange. Now, I know the data doesn't have information about that. It just has the pure ratings. It doesn't have why. can't tell you why. But I happen to know why. Uh, but let's see. Let's see if I actually know this. Um, so, why was there a drop in viewers uh, in Series 8? Let's see, does the ghost of Paul Hollywood actually know what caused this drop in viewers? And uh, because Mary Berry left the show. Okay, obviously, so suddenly the popularity went. Actually, because Mary Berry and also it moved over to Channel 4 rather than being on BBC, and it just caused a big spike in uh, viewership loss. But I have to program that in the background. We have to actually give the genie room a little bit of background, a little bit of hints, some instructions to tell it what to happen in these scenarios. And we could also do other things like so we could say well can i have a handshake am i am i gonna get the 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 reward of approval from paul hollywood for my data analysis skills that's the question that we can ask we're gonna oh my baking's not up to scratch i made a start oh, i did make a stodgy pie i had a soggy bottom but oh he's remembered okay well i can't i can't really do much about that well i could do the final thing uh who is your favorite consultancy that's what we want does does Paul Hollywood have a favorite consultancy that he would recommend? Advancing analytics is always a showstopper. They're kind of waking and AI is always top notch. Well, that's really nice of him, isn't it? Oh, I'm touched. And that's that's kind of what I wanted to show you today in terms of that. It's not about building a genie room that can answer any question you could possibly ever have. That's not the point. It's about actually your data, which if you're doing things properly anyway, should be organized into data products, which have kind of a distinct process they're trying to answer, a question, a set of questions. They are modeled 
to try and give you the answer to. And then if you're doing that and you've got some personality, you've got some Easter eggs, you've got a, a little bit of preempted questions to actually, you know what kind of things your user is going to ask, but you can get them more engaged than you can over and above a traditional dashboard. That is what this really, really shines as, as this new way of interacting with data. So yeah, this is our Ask Hollywood genie space that we've set up just to kind of show you how you should be thinking about things. And if you've had a look at Databricks Genie and then you've built something that honestly is a bit boring, you're kind of missing a trick. You're missing this new extra hook you have to engage people in data. If you ever go and speak to someone and say, oh, did you check out that latest dashboard? And they're like, oh God, data, it's boring, kill me. Well, actually, this kind of thing going, oh, have you had a play with this yet? Have you tried asking it a question? Have you ever tried asking it X, Y, Z? It's like when someone tells you to Google certain things that makes Google act in a weird way. Well, you can kind of do that inside some of your data systems now and actually just connect in a more personal level to the people actually using. So it's pretty cool what you can do. It's really good in terms of how you can actually pull this stuff together. So that is all I wanted to show you for today. Just as a little, a little teaser for the kind of things that we're starting to build now for clients to actually get them to think about data in a different way. So we'll do another video, which is showing you how we went and built this, how we go and do things like have gift style responses, how we preceded it with certain answers, how we give it little hints, how we set up the data behind the scenes to give it the best chance of answering those questions in a good way. We'll do that as a video, just a little tutorial guide about building this out. And then we'll do another video, which is all the best practices, going through the best practice guides, just giving you some information about how you should be thinking about this stuff, how to position it, how to have it in your head about where all this stuff should actually fit. That's the plan. Cool. Well, have a go. Come up with some ideas. Let me know down in the comments what ideas you have about genie spaces you want to build. Is there a problem you've had, problem like never been able to get people engaged with in a traditional dashboard and this just fixes it? It'd be awesome to hear the weird and wonderful things you guys come up with. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time. Cheers.